Now in Physics SL Topic 4, we have Oscillations and Waves. Now what I'm going to show you here then, maybe I'll write this in uh, red as well. We've got these first few things right here, and these are all with, well, having to do with, so all this right here up until this one, these are all to do with simple harmonic motion. Now we often call this, the short form for this is SHM. So if you have something undergoing simple harmonic motion, then you have all these different equations you might use. This one, let's maybe define that one. So this one, this is omega, that's the Greek letter, so omega. That is the, well we like to call that the angular frequency, or angular velocity. I'll call it angular frequency, it's a little bit better. So angular frequency, and that's measured in radians per second. So this is all about going around a circle. And if you have a, um, well, if you imagine you're going around in a circle, you're going to take a walk all the way around a circle. Your sort of speed is going to be measured in, well, the distance you've traveled divided by the time it took. So in this case, if your circle has a radius of one unit, then, out, well, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, but r, if you set that to 1, it just becomes 2 pi. And that's your, like, your distance here, and this is your time. Now, if you've gone around 2 pi, that we actually use these in radians. This is a little bit of a weird one here. We still have t, which is the period. And that's going to be measured in seconds. Should make sense, and we have units of, well, something over seconds. That's why it's radians per second. Now, this one right here, this x is a position. Okay, so x here, that's just a position. And we have v, which is just a speed. So that's going to be position in meters, and we're going to have a speed in meters per second. However, what we'll have then is this x0. This is the important thing here. So x0, that one right, whoops, I probably shouldn't have done that because I sort of covered it up. So this x0 right here, that represents, well, that's, we could say that's the amplitude. We could also call it the, what else could we say? Well, we could call it the maximum displacement because we're talking about something moving from equilibrium. So that would also be measured in meters. Now, of course, this here will be the maximum velocity here. So then the x is your position at any time, and then um, so what you'll do is you'll have something, you know, if it's oscillating back and forth, for example, you can take a look at what its position is, and then away you go, you can find these. Now, they don't often ask you for these on an exam, although it's useful to know them. But what they do sometimes ask you about is this, so EK. And EK is the, well, it's the kinetic energy. So that's going to be measured in joules. And EK max, well, that's the maximum kinetic energy. It turns out that happens when you have, well, when you're at equilibrium position, which means when your x value is zero. So if you take this EK right here, uh, this equation, and you set x equal to zero, do you notice this right here will cancel out? So then you'll just have one half m omega squared x zero. So that'll be this. By the way, m is still the mass. There's no problem there. m is still the mass like you think. Now, you also have et, that's the total energy. But it also helps to know that et is equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. So if you have something that's like, uh, I don't know, a spring or something like that, well, your total energy is just going to be your potential energy uh, plus your kinetic at any point. But it turns out with your graphs of SHM, you can see that at uh, zero displacement, you have no potential energy, uh, but you're at maximum kinetic energy. So that's why your total energy, if you notice, is the exact same as EK max. So that's actually kind of a handy thing. Now these are pretty useful, but even more useful, and I think I talked about this on the other videos, is memorizing this. Remember I said there's only a few equations to memorize? The one that's worth memorizing is this one. A equals minus omega squared x. This one is really worth memorizing. That's very, very helpful for simple harmonic motion. Maybe I'll even put stars around that one, just to tell you which ones are the most important ones to memorize.
This one is for sure. I would say if you're only going to memorize two equations out of this whole thing, I would memorize power is energy over time. And I would measure from topic four, at least, I would know that A equals minus omega squared X. And the reason it's useful to use this is because then if you do a graph of, ex of uh, displacement in meters, and you have this right here on the Y axis, you have acceleration in meters per second squared. If you look at this then, if this is the Y value and this is the X value, then this right here, although it looks weird, it's just going to be your slope. And because it's at negative value, that means this thing will have some sort of negative slope like this. And it turns out your definition of SHM, simple harmonic motion, all comes from this equation. Because then you could say that, oh, look, the more displacement I have, the more acceleration I have. So you could say that the displacement and acceleration are proportional to each other. And furthermore, you could say that, well, they're also opposite in sign, which means if you displace something in the positive direction, it wants to accelerate in the negative direction. And this should also make sense because if you have something vibrating back and forth, as you go way at the end right here, when it stops, it wants to go to the left. So then it'll go fly to the left. And then over here, it'll be at its maximum position on the left. That means it wants to go to the right. So what this means is that your displacement and your acceleration are opposite in sign. That's because you have a restoring force. Remember, force is related to acceleration. So this graph, I think, is really handy to know, but especially this equation here. That's how you deal with simple harmonic motion. So that's, that's all the SHM stuff. So that's like this. I'm just making it a line just to separate them. And now we have sort of more regular waves type stuff. So this one right here is known as the wave equation. That's what a lot of people call this. The wave equation. This tells you for anything, if you know V, so V is going to be the speed of the wave. That's in meters per second. We have F, which is the frequency. That's going to be measured in, well, hertz, or it could also be measured in one over seconds, because they're the same. And lambda is the wavelength. So because of that, then you can relate. That means if you know the speed of something, let's say it's light. Well, if it's light in a vacuum, then that's going to be going the speed of light. So C equals, v, uh, equals F lambda. And that means then if you know the frequency and the speed of light, then you can find the wavelength. Or conversely, if you know the wavelength and the frequency, you can find the speed and so on. So this basically, you're normally given two of these three things and you're trying to find the other one. This one right here is all about, I'm going to leave a little space here for a reason. This is all about refraction. So you use that one when you're working with refraction. So that one is called Snell's Law sometimes. And N is an index of refraction. So that's an optical property. It tells you something about how light will travel through this thing. I'm just going to erase this and move my of a little bit further just because it looks like it's index of all in one word. So it's index of refraction. Now it might be nice, you might want to add an extra little thing right here. Turns out that's also the same as lambda 2 over lambda 1. So that's also maybe a nice one to know about. So lambda 2 over lambda 1. That's maybe nice to use. I'm just going to erase this just because I don't want to run into the next equation here. So that would be that one. So this tells you about refraction, which means if light goes into from one medium to another, um, let's say it goes from medium 1 with index of refraction N1, and it goes into medium 2, which has another index of refraction N2. This tells you about the angle um, of the light. Remember, the angle that was defined from the normal. Or it could tell you about the speeds, or it can tell you about the wavelengths. But remember, the key thing here, though, with these is that the frequency remains unchanged. So that's why, I mean, you can, you can compare then the V and the lambda with the wave equation. So if F stays the same, going up by V means you go up by lambda if F stays the same. And it turns out in refraction, the frequency is unchanged. Now these two equations right here, those are all about, uh, well, we can call this um, interference. This tells you something about um, if two different waves went a different distance, then they'll actually interfere with each other. 
They can do that constructively or destructively. And I wish they just told you that because it says path difference equals n lambda. By the way, n is just a, it's an integer, so it's one or two or three dot dot dot. So it's just some sort of integer value here, and it's positive here. So n can be one or two or three. So what this tells you is, if two different light waves, or maybe two different water waves, whatever kind of wave you're looking at, if two different waves have traveled a difference in their path, in other words, they've traveled a different distance, well, if the path difference is, let's say, one times a wavelength, or twice the wavelength, or three times the wavelength, see, as long as it's just one integer number of the wavelength, then you're going to get what we call, so this one right here, maybe I'll label it in red here, this one right here is for constructive interference. So that means you'll have like a maximum value when you add these up, or these two waves. And this one right here, so this tells you, let's say it's 1 plus a half, so that'll be 1.5 lambda, or 2.5 lambda, or 3.5 lambda, then you get destructive interference. So that's how we use these ones. It helps to know that, though, that the first one is constructive, the second one is destructive. So that's most of the equations we need to look at, well, all of the equations that we get here for waves. And remember, the one that I recommend uh, memorizing is A equals minus omega squared x, because if you know that and its graph, this really helps you with the definitions of simple harmonic motion. So again, these first bunch of equations, although they look really scary, it's just a matter of, well, as long as you know what the different letters mean, you can totally have a chance on an exam. Right, you can totally know what to do. And again, this is the wave equation that comes in really handy all over the place. This one right here is for refraction. This tells you about interference, if you're going to have constructive or destructive interference.